Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thanks for listening to the Captain's Collective, where we travel around and hang out with fishing captains and other industry leaders. In this podcast, we get a chance to hear each guest's story and also hear about the tips, techniques, and lessons that they've learned along the way. Today's guest, Larry Hastings, was recommended to me by a former guest, Harry Spear, who told me that Larry had some of the best stories that he had ever heard. And that's exactly what this podcast is, an incredible compilation of stories that can only come from working over 60 years on the water. Larry spent over 40 years running a fishing yacht that traveled all around the world. And in this episode, he talks about how he became a captain, hunting in Central America out of helicopters, and the early days of bone fishing, which included push-pulling around the Bahamas with curtain rods. I hope that you guys enjoy. Thanks for the support. This is the Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. Uh, he tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Got uh, two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the. He's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Any time, I said, you talk so much, you're like a senator. Hey, Larry, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Well, uh, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this, so I'm a little rusty on something like this, but go ahead. Yeah, well, we'd just love to know how you got into fishing and how you got into being a captain. Okay, well... Um, my, my father was, uh, I was born and raised on a farm in, uh, in Greenbackville, Virginia. And uh, my father was in World War II. When he come home from the war, uh, we moved to Ocean City, Maryland. And um, that's where I got, uh, got away from the farm and got on the water. And uh, I worked, um, uh, when I was 14, 15 years old, I worked on, uh, on charter boats out of ocean city and we bottom fished and uh then we blue fished and then we uh then later on in the summer we started white marlin fishing and um they were old boats and uh when i look back on it and i don't know how they ever floated but um charter boat fishing in florida in uh, in in the early 60s um was nothing in the summer so the charter boats from Miami up to Palm Beach uh, would go to um, come north in the summer. they come all along the Carolina coast, Maryland, Virginia, all the way up to Massachusetts. And uh, we had five or six boats come to Ocean City, Maryland. And that's how I got uh, got to know about Florida. And a real good friend of mine that I run around with, his father had a charter boat in Hillsborough Inlet. And uh, so... um, (laughs) I talked about I I tried everything around home crabbing in the bay and clamming in the bay and uh, uh, ocean clamming on draggers and um, so uh, and I like froze to death doing it and you didn't make no money and it, it was it was dangerous work because of the old boats and a lot of them sank and, and a lot of people lost their lives in my time and so um, I told this to my friend Carky Van Fleet and. Uh, Carker said, well, Hastings, he said, ain't no need to hang around here in the winter. He says, 80, 82 and sunny, he says, that's what Florida is. So I was 14 years old when he told me that. And in those days, they were drafting, so I wanted to go and just get my service over with. So I graduated high school in 57, and I went to the Marine Corps for three years, three months, and six days. And I got out of the Marine Corps in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and I went to... Um, Went home to Ocean City, got my clothes, and three days later I was in Hillsborough, and I ain't never been back to Merlin except to visit. So I started out at Hills, or Hillsborough working on an old boat. It was, uh, this is really strange. She had a, a four cylinder diesel Kermuth on one side and a gasoline uh, Chrysler Crown on the other side. I mean, He'd start her up at the dock. She's twin screw. He'd start her up at the dock and get her out. As soon as you got her in the inlet, he shut off the gasoline engine. We'd run right on that one diesel engine all day. And that was from, that was, uh, let's see, uh, 
October of 1960, I got out and, um, and, and went down there, and, uh, and it was charter work, so he got paid um, $15 a day, half a day, $30 for all day. But we only, only got paid when we went. And I had a friend of mine that I knew his, I'd worked with his, his brother, and he was running a boat uh, in, uh, down at Pier 66, and Pier 66 in Fort Lauderdale had just opened. And, I mean, that was really a fancy marina for those days. And I went down there and went to work on a 42-foot um, a wooden wheeler. I worked that, uh, that winter for him, and we went north to Hatteras, North Carolina, and fished for Blue Marlin. And then I got done there and uh, finished up. Uh, we got to Ocean City, and the fellow said he didn't need me no more, so I worked on a charter boat that summer. And that fall, I went to work <laughs> at a gunning club. A uh, fellow, three fellows owned a gunning club, and I went to work with this gunning club. And I worked, uh, just the hunting season was just November, December. And uh, coming home one day, I looked down the bridge there, and there was a friend of mine that I'd met, Pier 66. And um, I took him and his and the mate to, to to get some something to eat. And when we got all done, um, they said that uh, they were going to Florida. If they found anything down there, that they would give me a call. So uh, in those days, uh, communication ain't like it is today. So you got letters. So I uh, I come home from from the hunting camp. We didn't hunt on Sundays, and uh, come home to hunting camp and had a letter from this guy. And he was at Ravovich Boatyard in West West Palm Beach, Florida. Fred said that there was a he didn't need nobody at the time, but there was a fellow standing there beside him, and uh, that, that needed a mate. And it was a forty-four foot Ravovich. And in those days, that was like working on a working on Rolls Royce and boats. They they were they were the the sport fishing boat. So the guy said, uh, "I don't know you, but uh, I'll hire you." And if it don't work out, I can pay you way back home. So I, after hunting season got over, I went uh, went back to Florida, and I worked for this fellow for two years. And everybody gets a break. And this fellow here was a a, a really good boat captain. Um, he was a, he was a good mechanic, and uh, he was a good fisherman. He was honest, and he was a good teacher. And that was my break. And as uh, far as having somebody to teach me, and not only uh, knew, but was w willing to, to teach me. And uh, so I worked for him for two years. And what we did, we went to Bahamas a little bit. Um, it was before much was going on in the Bahamas in the early 60s. And uh, we done a little bit of bone fishing out, out of uh, Fraser's Hog Key. Chub Key was being built in those days. And they, they were digging out the marina, but we anchored out, and we hired two local guides, uh, two Bahamians. And uh, the, what we'd use for boats, we had, uh, they had two 13-foot Boston whalers, and what they did, they pulled them backwards. You had to pull them backwards because you pulled them forwards. They slapped too much. They were flat. So you pulled them backwards, and the stern was round. And you just stood, uh, they had curtain, uh, those, the uh, curtain rods that you buy at the hardware store and they put a foot on it and that's what you use for a push pole and um, <laughs> so um, that was my introduction to bone fishing and then that and the, the, the main reason this man had this boat was he liked to sword fish so we would um, we would leave uh, go north in early june and and we worked out a deep sea club in montauk new york and uh from montauk new york we would we would fish all. It was sight fishing. You ride around in the tower till you seen one, and then you baited them. And if you caught three or four fish for the summer, you had a good summer. Uh, you baited a lot. You get them on, but they they all gets to get all fouled up. And you broke lines and broke leaders, and and it it, it, it was. But it was the the hunt was as much fun as as actual catching of the fish. And the first summer I was there, we caught one that weighed over five hundred pounds. Wow. So. Uh, but anyhow, um, we would follow the fish east to uh, Nantucket and uh, follow the 30, 20, 30 fathom line east to Nantucket. And we'd get to Nantucket, then the summer was pretty much over. 
and then we come back south and 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 do that same thing again. Uh, uh, we fish sailfish out of Palm Beach to two or three tournaments in Palm Beach. The captain, like I said, was such a night. Nice, him and I had such a good relationship, and he told me, and you got to realize I'm in my early twenties, and he said. Um, Larry, he says, you don't want to be a mate the rest of your life. He says, there's there's professional mates, and he said, you, you, you've got what it takes to be a captain. And he said, you have to start out at the bottom. And he said, um, I'm not trying to drive you off the boat, he said, but, um, and, I, and I really enjoy working, having you work for me. He said, but you're going to have to start somewhere, so just take a job, the first job that comes along. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I... I met my wife in West Palm Beach, and we were coming around uh, Cape Canaveral, and we broke a broke a <laughs> broke a gas tank, and we stopped in West Palm Beach. And I was living in Lauderdale, and the boat was in Lauderdale. In 1960, I went to work at Hillsboro Inlet on the Condor Three. In '61, I worked on the Had Two, and in '62 and '63, I worked on the Nitso, and. Uh, then I went to work on the Olive E3. That was the boat, Warren O'Neill boat. And then um, worked on the Cavarondo, uh, working out of, uh, that was for the family from New York. I mean, from Wilmington, Delaware. And then I went to work on a boat called a Georgetta. And he was a Ford, uh, Ford and Cadillac dealer from Long Island. And, um, he was, and he was a sword fisherman, too. And this is where I really got into bone fishing. This old old boat was a, probably the ugliest boat I ever seen in my life, and you never got embarrassed to go to the dock. It was so ugly, but uh, we uh, had a twelve foot aluminum boat on the bow, and he had a nine horsepower Mercury motor stuck up inside of it that we never had used, and we went to Walker's Key in February. And um, it, I remember because it was cold and and we were trying to fish offshore. And before, but being or hanging around Ravovich that winter, I met three or four captains that had, had done this bone fishing, uh, really was serious about it, and, and, and had gone, would go over to just go bone fishing. And I said to the owner of the boat, I said, uh, what, we're weathered in here. Why don't we go down from Walker's Key down towards uh, down the Abacos and, and uh, see if we look for one of them bonefish everybody talks about. So um, we we haul off, and it was just, it, it never had just, this was always just a man and his wife. So we went down there, and we got uh, got this aluminum boat overboard, it had slided off the bow, and got the mercury motor, and we had, I had never tried to start the daggone thing, and we got in the water, and we couldn't get it started. He was a mechanic, and we never, he says, well, let's, let's, let's go home. And he says, we'll buy a brand new motor, and we'll come back over here, and we'll, we'll look for him. So I went home, and I found out that, that what they use, we, I was using ore in this aluminum boat. We, we did get close enough to try to look for him, but we could, we, we were really hampered. We, so we gave up on it, came home, and we come back, and we got a, a 10 horsepower Johnson motor, brand new, and a six gallon gas tank, to rigged up two closet rods with wooden closet rod with, with a foot on them. And we, we went back over there, and, and we started seeing these bonefish. Well, <laughs> We we didn't have much luck to start with because we didn't know what kind of bait or and and we were trying our hooks were too big for the fish and and, and what year what year is this? Okay, we're talking about nineteen in nineteen sixty. Uh, nine no, excuse me, nineteen sixty six. We really got into it and started doing it, and then we um, you got to realize that we had a uh, a fourteen foot aluminum boat with a nine horsepower motor and we did rig it up we rigged up plywood across the seats so they could stand in the bow and rigged up plywood in the back so i could stand in the back and three people in a 16 foot boat fishing it was uh, and we did this it was, uh, with sincerity we really chased them and we got we got pretty proficient we, we could catch them we had like i said we started out wrong but we we learned as we went so then he decided he was going to build a 68-foot aluminum boat, 
and we started that in uh, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, it was uh, really a backward yard, to say the least. It took us two years to build it, and there was only five people worked in the yard. Uh, meanwhile, back at the ranch, we still had the wooden boat, so we'd done some fishing with that. But meanwhile, about a year, he, I, I spent two years in the area of Pennsylvania uh, and, and, and uh, helping build this boat. And finally, we got it, and um, it was, uh, uh, we had two uh, 16-foot aluminum boats on the bow, and we had really rigged them up for, for we didn't have polling towers, but uh, we, we really rigged them up uh, nice for fishing. And uh, I had a, a, year, a year round mate working for me, so when we'd go fishing, I'd we uh, one the boss lady or the boss man we split the boats, and we then we started venturing out. We started fishing the west side of Andros, and in those days, uh, there the uh, looking at the charts, you would never go down there because it was zero one zero four or zero nothing. There, it just looked like it was too shallow to fish. And, of course, charts were made in the 1800s by the British throwing a lead line. So uh, uh, it was um, – it, it, I didn't know anybody else had been down there. So we started fishing on the south end of Andros going into a place called Jackfish Creek. And you could get in there, and it was well protected. And um, so we done, we done a lot of fishing down there. And then we started, started fishing on uh, – Williams Island on the west side of Andros and working our way south. And in those days, there was nobody. And I mean, the only people down there in those days were sailboats and, uh, uh, that would come through the North Bight, uh, uh, Middle Bight, and South Bight and would come over there uh, sponge fishing. And uh, so, uh, but we still went north and swordfished. And um, so I worked for him, like I said, until... Uh, January of 1973. It, it was just one of those deals where, uh, well, I needed to move on. And uh, so we had this boat in New York, and um, it's funny how these things take place in your lifetime. Uh, uh, I always said life is like a pinball machine. you bouncing from one pin to the other, and 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 the circumstances comes along you really don't realize uh, at the time until you look back on it later in life but a job came open with the family that i went to work for on a sport fishing boat they had a 43 foot sport fishing boat and we were in um um uh freeport i mean yeah freeport new york in, in freezing to death in october and i'd i'd already made up my mind i was going to when i got back south i was going to look for another job and we got no me and this fella got in a phone booth and called a really good friend of mine that was running this sport fishing boat for the family that i wanted to work for gary said in the phone booth there this fella that's running sport fishing boat i told you they were looking for a mate on a sport fishing boat and i told jack i says look he was him and i worked together uh, had worked together a couple of years on this on this uh, boat for for the, the uh, Cadillac dealer. I said, take this job with this this family. I said because it's really a good job. You and I both know it. it's been around a long time, and they've been in the business. And this guy at the time was a giant. His main thing was giant tuna fishing out of Cat Key. In other words, they they never had the boat for. 12 months a year just to have those three or four weeks of t bluefin tuna fishing out of, out of Cat Key. So uh, uh, we were in the phone booth. Our, uh, Gary said that the family was going to build an, a yacht. Meanwhile, when I, the boat, that uh, this, this Luna boat that was built in Pennsylvania had a big pair of Caterpillar engines, and I'd been to Caterpillar school, always was interested in mechanics, um, always learned how to change plugs and and time engines, and and uh, so went to Caterpillar School and, and, and learned a lot more about diesel engines up in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, when we were building this boat in Pennsylvania. But anyhow, uh, he said they were building a 98, they were going to build a 98-foot aluminum uh, yacht, and I just said, are they looking for any crew? He said, I don't know much about it. He said, but I'll call the boss's son, and the boss's son was the one that was interested in this 
sport fishing, uh, tuna fishing. So he said, uh, call me back tomorrow. So I called him back, and he said, um, the other, he said, they've, they've started the boat. This is in October of 72. I said, uh, he said, they've started the boat, but the boat's not going to be done until July. And he said, they've already hired a captain. Well, you don't move from a sport fishing boat to a running 98-foot yacht. That ain't, that, ain't, that ain't a stepping stone. You don't do that. And, uh, of course, another thing was I knew that they that this wasn't a yacht yacht. In other words, it, it was, they wasn't yacht club people. And they'd done a lot of hunting and they'd done a lot of fishing. And I knew they'd done the fishing. And I knew that they were really interested in the bone fishing. Well, this I had experience at. I mean, when they when I found out who the captain was, they said the captain was uh, Captain Dave Marsett. Well, I had met Dave at Pier 66. I knew him real well, could play golf with him, had lunch with him. So I called him and I said, Dave, I said, I understand it. Go, no, you're going to be the captain for this family. And uh, he said, uh, yes, he said, but uh, Larry, this is October. I can't hire you right now. I said, well, I understand that. I said, I, I got to get the boat back south, and I got to get, get things straightened up on my end here first. I said, uh, he said, but I'll hire you in February. I said, well, I got a wife and three kids now. I said, I need, I, I can remember the number just like it's yesterday. I said, I need $950. That's what I'm making now. He said, that ain't no problem. So I went to work for him uh, verbally, and uh, we went to, uh, uh, I, I let the man that I was working for, I gave him three months' notice and told him, I says, in February I'm leaving. Of course, he never would think, he, he was trying, by that, that time he was trying to give me the Cadillac dealership, and I wouldn't have worked for him if he gave me the world. Of course, being, being brand new to the job, uh, when we got right, when we launched the boat, and this is the first time I had met the owner and, and his daughter-in-law. They came up for the launching, flew into a mountain to walk, and they flew out of Green Bay. And they asked me if I'd drive the boss man uh, back to Green Bay and his, and his, and his daughter-in-law. They ran some cars. I said, sure. And I got talking to the gentleman, and his first time I'd ever met him. They had two 17-foot Makos with fathom meters and and uh, and radios and and all this stuff and a 17 foot mako draws a lot of water when you're thinking about skiff fishing and, and flats fishing you know you're new you're a new guy in town and they told me well we're going to use these for bone fishing well talking to the gentleman he said uh, you know, and that's all he talked about. I mean, for an hour I drove him back there. He all he wanted to talk to me about was bone fishing, and so I didn't say anything to the captain, and I didn't say anything to to the owner. He was he's the owner of the boat. Him and his son. They said that what they did they like to do was they like to wade. Well, that makes a different story. You can get them close enough where you can put them out on the, on a the flat and, and let them wade if that's what they want to do. But I always, I, I, I never was, till this day, never convinced me wading was the way to fish because you're too far down in the water, you're making too much noise, and you wade away from the boat, then you got to wait get back to the boat, and if you want to move, it's, it's not that easy. But if that's what they want to do, that's what we'll, we'll do. The architect had knew that we were going to try to land a Bell Ranger helicopter on the back of this thing. And, of course, uh, we got to a floating dock in Port Washington, New York, and the helicopter pilot had um, drawn out on the ground at the airport the size of where he had to land on the boat. So uh, what we did, the first go around, we took these two 17-foot Makos, and we set them in the water. Everybody got off the boat. I mean, there wasn't nobody. Nobody was in the cook store. All of us went up the dock when the helicopter was going to land. They, they hadn't, this, this was all experiment. They never, never, I mean, I can see it coming now. That that sucker came in there, and I mean, he just sat it right down on the on the deck, and it was, I mean, it was nothing to it at all. So shut it down and got out and walked around, and uh, we had to change the uh, had changed boat papers, so we uh, the captain and myself and the helicopter pilot uh, flew from Port Washington, New York, downtown to Sixty First Street helicopter pad and changed it. Now that how was, common was that? That that then? that wasn't that we were there was not. Another helicopter, the only helicopter I knew about, there was a guy who had a boat in Palm Beach, and he had a helicopter sitting on the back of it with no engine, just for show. 
It was one. one it was one. So of, he just had a, a decoy. Yeah, it was a decoy. It was just just a boat to show that he had a helicopter on deck. I don't. I guess <laughs> I guess he put it up there with a crane. I don't know. But anyhow, um, uh, th- th- this this was feasible. No, we're just we, and we had. Um, she carried about um, about four or five thousand gallons of diesel fuel, but we carried fifteen hundred gallons of jet fuel. In, in, in a separate tank for it. And, and so the owners would fly in on the helicopter? Well, at times. And, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a second. What, they, what, what, what that ended up being was the greatest asset that anybody ever had as far as in Bahamas was concerned or Central America, South America, Panama. Because they, they could fly in on their jet. we pick them up and we could be anywhere with the boat. Because they, they they just fly right to us, but um, so we we went to Bahamas this first trip, picked them up in Life of Key, and went over to Burry Islands. And um, uh, Mr. Phipps said to me he been he been itching to go. We uh, we went up around uh, Jolders Key, and uh, he said, uh, uh, "Larry, you and I are going bone fishing." I said, "Yes, sir." So load him up in that Mako, just him and I, and away we went and. We went up a little blue channel, and, and uh, all behind shoulders is mud. It's not uh, it's not hard sand. It's like a uh, round, it looks like the moon, uh, kind of round and, and muddy and slippery, and you're slipping and sliding. But he said he wanted to go wading, so him and I get out of the boat, and and I got the rods, and, and we we can see some bonefish, and it's tide's not just right, and it's kind of falling. I, it's like it yesterday. <laughs> and... Him and I started, and we hadn't walked 50 or 60 feet. And I, what I didn't realize, I said, this gentleman was not in very good shape. <laughs> and he got stuck in the mud. Now, here I am. A, <laughs> he weighs about 230 pounds, and I weigh about 150 soaking wet. And <laughs> and he's hanging on to me. And uh, I just did get him back to the boat. Well, I, I told myself right then and there, this man is not a waiter. So we... we uh, from that time, from that very first trip, I started talking to the captain and talking to the, the boss himself and talking to his son. And eventually, near about that winter, we, we tried these Makos, and, it, and it, it, it wasn't working. And I talked them in to buying two 16-foot aluminum boats with 35-horsepower motors and six-gallon gas can, and now we're back, we're, we're back to square one. We decided we are going to go to Mexico. So we took off, and uh, here we go with the helicopter and the fish boat, and we had a table. I mean, when we sat down at the table down in the cruise mess, we, it was a full room. There wasn't no, <laughs> there wasn't much much elbow room, but we made it work. Six of us had one bathroom, one shower, and one toilet. Captain had his own little room, and we and we traveled a lot. We averaged being gone away from Palm Beach 120 days a year. In other words, we went somewhere every month and uh, one of the greatest parts about the job was and why everybody lasted so long i always said was they never used us june july august or september the boat laid up and then and that and all the 44 years that i worked for them we only went north of fort pierce twice one year we went all the way to canada and i'll get to that story later the, the fun parts of these trips was we started out going down to Mexico. That was that was our first jaunt. We went down to Cosmel, Mexico, and cleared in customs. And um, when we got there, Mr. Phipps had had a hunting guide that was from Fort Myers, Florida, that was, I mean, he could smell a fish, and he could find places to hunt like you wouldn't believe. So we, we were in um, Cosmel before we always went ahead of time, try to get there ahead of time, get things set up. And um, well, there was a guy in there, a sailboat, that spoke real good Spanish, and he told this uh, uh, Fingers O'Bannon, he said, uh, I know a game warden down in Ascension Bay, a Mexican game warden. So they took the helicopter, and they flew down to a, a little town in Ascension Bay, and they picked up the game warden, and he was a little Mayan Indian in Santo May, and they brought him to us. Now, you got to realize this this poor fellow he can't speak any english but the, the, we got lucky that this 
sailboat guy could speak English. We, we what, what he told him, we were looking to hunt turkey or deer or whatever we could shoot on the edge of the jungle, and we also wanted to fish. So we started out, um, we went down to Ascension Bay, and you got to realize had the fish boat to go ahead of us because he could he had a tuner tower. He could get in the tuner tower, and he could find a way through these rocks and reefs. I mean, ain't no marked channels down there. So we got in Ascension Bay. Ascension Bay is about 18 miles by 20 miles, uh, if you squared it off. And we got in there, and I mean, it it had everything. I mean, there was bonefish everywhere. There was permit tail deep to a giraffe. I mean, it was it was fantastic fishing, and nobody but a couple of dug, uh, natives would dug out canoes. Is this in the seventies, somewhere around there? Se- early seventies. Okay. Yeah, in the early seventies. You're talking about the starting now. Uh, I started with them in seventy three, and then we started out right away going down that way. That that, that first seventy three and seventy four, we started going that way, and the more we went, the more we found out, and the more we found out, but the more fun we had. Now, when I tell you some of these stories that I'm going to tell you now, you, you ain't you, most people ain't going to believe it, but it, it is the truth. Uh, we took the doors off that helicopter, and Mr. Phipps would put on his camouflage gear with his 10-gallon Stetson hat, and he would get on one side, and the helicopter pilot would be sitting, helicopter pilots always sit to the right, and me and Mr. Phipps was shoot a right hand shooter. He would shoot. He would sit to the left, and they, and they, it would take two shooters when they go hunting. They after somebody shot something, then they would land the helicopter and change places. And the guy was always he always shooting out of, out of the out of the left. And Jacinto May, the, the little Mexican, I got pictures of it. He'd sit up front in his helicopter, and he would tell them where to go. Well, what what you you had to shoot. Whatever you're shooting, the deer, or the, we shot some beautiful turkeys down there. I mean, turkey, great big old blue heads, and, and, and shot a lot of deer, and them suckers were fat and good eating. I don't know what they eat, but they were good. And But we, we, we never shot anything that we didn't eat. No, we, we didn't go in there and just slaughter everything, and we always shot so we could recover it. In other words, if they, the edge of that whole 20-some miles around was jungle down to like marshland, flatlands, where you could shoot them and so you could, could retrieve them so you could land that chopper. A lot of it was sharp grass so you could land and pick up what you were shooting. So uh, now we, I got pictures of it. We used to bring the deer back to the boat, the f- fish boat would be tied alongside, and we'd take the davit. And we string the deer up and 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 and, and clean the deer. I would and, love and, to and, see that photo. So 1970s, you guys are packed into a, 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 a boat together, you're driving it down to Mexico, you get there, you take the doors off the helicopter, you fly around with this Mayan local guide, shooting turkey and deer, and then I'm guessing you guys would do some bone fishing and permit fishing well, in that, the that, afternoon. That, or... All right, here, here's, here's what would go down. When you got up in the morning, uh, we always, we talked about it in the evening before over cocktails, but when we got up in the morning, everybody had breakfast. Now, you got to realize that Mr. Phipps was a very regimented person. Breakfast went at 7.30 for everybody. The crew ate at 11.30, and the party ate at 1.30 for lunch. So you were going to do whatever you are going to do in that time limit. So in the afternoon, everybody, they, after they had lunch at 1.30, it took at two thirty. Things would start all over again. So, in the morning, you had your choice to go sport fishing on the fighting lady, in the ocean. He'd go back out through the reef and fish in the ocean, or you could take the helicopter and go hunting, or you could take two skiffs or three skiffs later on and go bone fishing, permit fishing. So, and you rotate the people around. And Mr. Phipps always had a full complement. We always had uh, uh, most of the time eight people. And and as as a party, and uh, he had some of the greatest. He had, and had, we had repeat customers all the time. It was it was just just his friends, and he had some great friends. And um, so we started out in Ascension Bay, and then well, there's another bay south of it called Santo Bay. It's not exactly how you say it, but it's the next big bay south of Ascension Bay. 
And then we started out going down to Belize. And, and this is over a period of years. And uh, we would probably go to Mexico and Belize at least twice, three times a, a, a season. Mr. Phipps always came in October, and he always left Memorial Day. And his what he would do, which is unheard of, I've never heard of another person doing it. In October, we would sit down and talk about what we were going to do till January. And you could put it on the calendar. And in January, he would sit and talk about what we are going to do till Memorial Day. And you could put it in stone. And in 44 years I worked for him, he never canceled a trip, and he never was late. Mm. Never. When we started going to Belize, that was another place that was just virgin territory. I mean, but I, uh, uh, I realized that what Mr. Phipps loved to do as much as anything was shoot his gun. Mm-hmm. And this fellow from the West Coast that I told you about, it was, he, he went with us on all these trips, not, not the Bahamas, but down, down in Central America. He could see one bird fly in the morning, and we would get the gun, and then we carried as many shotguns and guns. I mean, you, you couldn't even begin to do what we'd done. Like back. a little military coming Well, well we, carried, we had all size sh- shotguns, and we had cases and cases of shotgun shells. What we'd do, we'd put two people in a boat and set them in the bow, and you couldn't stand up to shoot. You had to sit and shoot. So if you had, if it ever shoulder to shoulder, you couldn't you couldn't swing around and shoot one another. And you always had to shoot in front of you. You couldn't shoot behind you or off to the sides. So we shot a lot of pigeons. There's a lot of, of uh, he's he's a he's a big pigeon here. We don't have wild pigeons like that here, right around here. And I I think one of them was called a rufous pigeon. And uh, so what we do, we uh, these pigeons would fly out of these mangroves, and these man- the mangroves down there are like 20, 30 feet high, big mangrove trees. And we get in these rivers and places where these pigeons would go, they go to the mountains during the day, and then they'd come back to roost at night. And when they come back to roost at night, we'd shoot them. And most of the time, we'd have uh, native kids. Uh, we get a Santo May to get pick get some natives with with um, with their dugouts and they they retrieved the birds, and I got I got pictures of it home. Of, I mean there was bird feathers and kids and and uh, and, and, and dug, five or six dugout canoes behind the boat pass. It's incredible. It, I would love to see those photos. You'll have to send them <laughs> in. And was it, was was it common for people to be so into hunting that would be running a boat operation like that? I mean, was not that-, that I knew of. He was, but he had done it back in the in the sixties, in the fifties down in Cuba. He done in, in Dominican Republic before we. And so Mr. Phipps had done this before. And what was your favorite? So we've talked about you would do bill fishing, you would do bone fishing. I, I love the stories too of just like the aluminum boat and y'all putting plywood out there and using a. That was the first time I've heard anybody talk about a curtain rod. You know, yeah. using a curtain rod well, with a foot on it. And what what was your favorite thing to go out and do out of all those different experiences? Personally? Bone fishing. Bone fishing. Oh, yeah. And that's your absolute favorite. Now, where was your favorite place between Mexico and the Bahamas? and West side of Andros and the west side of uh, Abacos. Now, what what about it just made it so Well, the thing is about it, first of all, nobody else was there. I mean, now, now you can't say that now. There's hunting guy. There's fishing camps all over Andros and all over the Abacos. But when we first started going down there, it was virgin territory. I mean, there there was there, there was never, the only thing stopped you from catching fish was the weather. And did you ever see other boats out there doing never, it? Or? Never. Never. And, but as, as time went by, yes. In other words, the, the operation was copied as time went by. Sure. And so you guys are out there. We, we had that story about, uh, you know, having some some issues wading in the mud. Yeah. But you'd be out there on the bow of the boat pushing around. And what was y'all's kind of approach like when you first started figuring out bonefish? Because you said that you didn't even really know at first what to throw at them, and it wasn't common. What did you guys do? What was your setup like for that? Well, we, we, we started out with, uh, uh, like I told you, the, the hooks was too big, the, the shrimp were too big, and everybody thought that you couldn't catch them on the— 
Oh, he he had to have shrimp and and uh, well, I uh, fooled around and I, you could catch as many bonefish. You got to realize this is before fly rods. That that came later. The fact of the matter is, it, it saved our our jobs really because the, the boss's son got into fly rod fishing, and all of his guests too. But uh, there's a, a a jig called a Phillips pink jig. It, it's it happened you get them in colors but I, my favorite was the pink and it's just a little quarter ounce half ounce uh, quarter ounce jig uh with a with a hook on it and i'd put a little piece of shrimp on the end of that and um uh, that and, and, and that was all the weight you needed using eight and ten pound test line we used small spinning rods and eight and ten pound test line and you there would be times that we'd get a a 10, 12 pound fish on, and, and we'd lose the line. I mean, we yeah. could, you couldn't hold them. And, and so I'm just thinking about the operation you guys are running. I mean, a lot of guides that we talk to, they kind of specialize in a handful of things. So maybe it's a bonefish, or we got some lined up with guys who focus on tuna or certain billfish. But you guys were doing a pretty big variety of things during a time where there wasn't a ton of information. How would you guys kind of figure it out what to do? I mean, it was it was trial and error. Everything everything evolved. We went from those seventeen foot makos. I went down in the keys. Uh, the the captain the captain Dave was still with us at the time. In the seven in between seventy three and seventy seven, we went down in the keys looking for skiffs. And we went to Summerlin Key and talked to two or three guys. And everything we found down there was too big, uh, too heavy drew too much water we were looking for something we're going to get the buck passer within um a mile or a mile and a half of most times sometimes within a quarter mile of shoreline so you don't need something that's to get you in rough water in other words if if it's blowing and it's rough you just ease into the beach and then you go north or south or whatever way uh, up and down the beach to fish so we went down there, and we we had, we were coming back, and we got to Tavernier, and there was a a boat there said uh, Roberts Boat Works. So we pulled in there, and this gentleman's name was Willie Roberts, and he was building Florida's Florida's flat flat uh, skiffs, and uh, we explained to him what we wanted. And in those days, we had fixed davits. Later on, we uh, on the other boat we had cranes. But a fixed davit had a little electric motor, and they they swung out, and it was manual, and it was real, real slow. And uh, so that that's what we were working with. So we told Mr. Roberts we wanted we wanted two boats. We wanted a 16-footer, and we wanted a 14-footer because that's the only place we had on that 98-footer for, for the – was uh, 18 feet would have been maximum – because the way the davits were in the helicopter for the open boat deck that we had. I knew that, uh, that he, he, he was back, back ordered on building these boats, and uh, he had four or five boats in line, and he said to me, he said, because uh, uh, Captain Dave said to me, he says, you're the one that's going to pull these things. I'm a yacht captain. I don't know nothing about these boat, fish boats. So uh, I told Mr. Roberts, I said, <clears throat> we only have, so much height and i get i had all the numbers with me i'd written down how much height we had on the davits as far as swinging them out and picking, picking them up and putting them down he says well he said why don't i build one boat the big boat so the small boat will sit inside of it and we'll take the foredeck off of the big boat have it portable and then sit down in the bottom and i'll build chocks in the bigger boat for the small boat to sit in so it's not rocking and rolling around so that's he said he said i tell you what he said i'm i'm tired of building 18 footers 18 footers 18 footers and this is a challenge and i'm i'm really interested in this and i'll start them right away so he did and uh we got these got these two boats from him and i remember going down and picking them up and we had a 25 25 horsepower and a 60 gallon gas tank on the little one and we had a 35 horsepower and a six gallon gas tank on the big one and uh, now we got uh, but we still no, no polling platforms 
or this was all stand on the back and pole. And uh, but uh, these these little boats really really hit the hit the uh, what we what really what we needed. And um, so when we got uh, after we built those boats and and got them, we had like I said, Mako on one side and these two boats on the other, and then we got we got rid of the aluminum boats on the bow. I've left out a little bit here. The Phipps decided they, they they wanted to make a change in captains. I was in Ocean City, Maryland, and uh, I got a phone call, and I was on my way to Maine to visit some friends, and I got a phone call, and they asked me to um, uh, stop by New York that they needed to talk to me. And uh, I hadn't got a phone call from them in four years, so I didn't want the world. I thought somebody maybe had died or something. And they didn't tell me over the phone what they wanted, so we stopped by and, and uh, spent the night with the boss's son. They said, now, we, we're going to ask you, to, we want you to run the boat, and if you don't, we're going to hire another captain. So I t the first thing popped, it was, it was such a shock to me, and, and, and it is the large truth. I, the last thing in my mind was that, that, I, that, they, that I, was, I thought everything was uh, uh, going long peachy. But... Um, I said, well, if if I don't work out as as uh, as the captain, I want my mate engineer's job back. <laughs> and how old were you in there asking you to run this boat? Uh, I was uh, I was thirty four. I was thirty four when they asked me to run the boat. Yeah. So I told him, I said, I ain't worried about the physically running of the boat. I can handle the boat. I said, what I'm worried about, I said, I've never had a handle a crew. And uh, Mr. Phipps said, well, he said, Larry, he says, uh, if uh, if we didn't think you could have done it we wouldn't ask you to uh wouldn't ask you to take the job so uh after that was 40 years later i was still there wow yeah but anyhow um uh, we uh the, the first thing i did when i got the job you talk about things you do uh trial and error the anchor used to be on deck on the bow and you had to pick it up with a davit and swing the sucker over and drop it down and unhook it and a lot of times you'd be anchored somewhere where that thing's rocking and rolling. And when you got ready to get it back up, you're always trying to get the hook and the, and the anchor to get it back on deck. And we got some really rough weather one time coming back from Mexico. And the sucker washed, the, the, the sea washed the anchor off the deck and it come rolling down the teak, eating up the teak. So I knew that the way to go was have an have a anchor in the hose pipe in the, back, in the hull. So that was one of the first things I did. The next thing I did, I called it a mailbox. She was a closed pilot house with no wing stations. So when you come to the dock or you were in in the in the in the pilot house, you had about thirty five or forty feet of bow looking over and you couldn't see down in the water from the from the pilot house. So what I did, I put a Control, just a control station, and it looked like a mailbox up on top of the pilot house, and put a tiller control with a set of con uh, throttles and clutches on top of the pilot house. Now you can look down over the bow into the water. Plus, you when you're getting ready to dock the thing, you can see all on the top of it. You can see all four sides. No, where you see both the bow and the stern. So that was. Two things that I did, and it really worked out. The fact of the matter is, when we built the new boat, I put a helm station up on top of the new boat, too. But, but the new boat had wing controls, and that, that made a world of difference, too. So what we did, you're talking about how you, how you do, do, do these things. Um, when, from the time I got the job in 77 until we... Uh, uh, contracted to build a new boat in 84, I had a little red spiral notebook, and every time that I would think of something, or the boss would think of, or say something, they didn't have to think it or say something, you know, um, maybe I'd need, need a little more closet space, or maybe I'd the, the cook needs more free, uh, freezer space. I knew I needed more jet fuel because we used to burn up, uh, we'd burn up 1,300 gallons, 1,500 gallons of jet fuel in Ascension Bay and have to go back to Cosmo and get more jet fuel for the next party coming in. So uh, I knew I needed more jet fuel. 
and we did we needed more space for the crew and that was one thing we really got in the new boat was really nice crew space so what i did for from 77 to 84 when when mr hargrave jack hargrave designed both boats and Jack Hargrave is the one that told us about his shipyard in Japan. That's how we ended up in Japan building it. So uh, I put everything in that little red notebook. And when we got ready to talk to Mr. Hargrave about building it, I handed him the notebook. And I said, Mr. Hargrave, I'm a boat captain, not a yacht builder, not a naval architect. And I says, this, this is what we need. And he drew up the plans, and he sent them to the Phipses, and they never were changed. And Mr. Hargrave said, I got to know him when we built the, built the burger. And his office was right there in Palm Beach, and he got to be a real good friend of his. And I used to stop by there and talk to him a lot. And when they decided to build a boat, to, to build a new boat, he told me, he says, he wanted to come over. I met him one Saturday, and, and Mr. Phipps and, and Denny and myself sit down on the back of the boat. Mr. Hargrave said, well, you know, he said, I've been talking to Larry for the last eight ten years he said and, and he says if you don't build a 120 foot boat you just will not do not build it he says you're not you're not going to gain and get what you need in a boat if you build it that small and he says i can um, i can design a boat uh, 120 some feet to, to, to light on fuel will draft under under seven feet and draft about seven foot two or three fully loaded six feet is 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 getting close if you going around the Bahamas, as far as depth of water, seven feet, you better know where you're going. It's just that critical in a lot of places. Uh, places that I went with the old boat from '73 to '85. <laughs> what did the old boat draft? Six. Six. But six fully loaded. I mean, she drew. She only drew five eight five seven five eight. Uh, light. And when we got the new boat, I had the shiniest key on the fleet. I literally run aground several times. I was mean, that a pretty tight knit community of other yacht captains? No, it wasn't nobody. Wasn't no more. There was one or two of us, three or four of us. And it, as time got by, um, there was probably there's only probably about a dozen do it now. But. And, and one of the things we like to ask captains is, <laughs> you know, you had all this experience. If I'm doing the math right, over 50 years of working on boats, 44 as a captain, um, or even more than that, I, I guess if you, you said that you started working on a boat at 13 or 14, and then you ended at 75, so to do the math here, we're talking about 60 years on the water working for boats. Yeah. So I think you, you definitely are going to have the record here on the Captain's Collective for most time <laughs> on the water. Um, we'll send you a trophy or something. Uh, but... What, what do you feel like makes the difference between a good captain and a great captain? Well, you, you, sur you surround yourself with good people, and you let them do their job. Hmm. You, 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 don't, you don't have to. Uh, I, I, we got ready to go on a trip. I never had talked to I never had to. I said, look, we're, I tell the cook, I said, we're going to be, we're gonna be gone 10 days. He went and bought the groceries. The steward went and bought the booze, the wine. The engineer done what he needed to do, and 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 the mate and myself went to the bait and tackle store and got what we needed. You you got you got to trust the people that you have working for you, and you've got to be you've got you got to bite your tongue a lot, because when you got that many people living that close together, that long of periods. You 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 you, you got to let, shed a lot of water off your shoulders. And if things it, there there's a way to say things, and there's a way not to say things. You can be very diplomatic and 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 get get your point across uh, uh, without hollering or screaming. And, and when you and when you're talking to somebody, get them off to the side, just you and them one on one. It, it, it never does any good. Uh, a sharp tongue never does any good to anybody. Uh, I, I always enjoyed the relationship I had with the crew. I really did. Uh, and, and the thing that I now that I haven't done it for three or four years, the thing I miss the most, I miss going to Bahamas. I I, I really look forward to that. It was it was it was a lot of fun. And sixty years on the water, I mean, traveling all over. Did it ever get old? Never. Never got old. 
Never ever did I ever wake up in the morning and go to work that I wasn't looking forward to that day or had the day planned as I was driving. And I left the house every morning at 6 and was there at 7. I left there at 2.30 and I was home at 3.30. But I never got up in the morning and dreaded going to work. If you don't like your work as much time as you spend at it, you go in the wrong business. Um, no, I, and I I really enjoyed it. And, and, and I, I would still, if, if my boss had lived, I'd still be working. Uh, yeah. And because I, I'm, I'm, I've, the Lord's been good enough to give me my health that I, I, that I, that I, ain't, I ain't lost my mind yet, and I haven't lost my, 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 my physical ability to do things. And, and with the flats fishing, so you guys would do bill fishing, hunting, tuna fishing, flats fishing, bone fishing. What did you enjoy, even as like the lead captain? Did you still go out and pull around for bone fish every day? Every day. Every day. We could put, when we got that boat with, with the cranes, when we got the hydraulic cranes, we could put four 18-foot skiffs overboard in 20 minutes and pick them up in 20 minutes. And there was a time you guys had four skiffs on there? There's times we had five skiffs on there. Wow. We That's had, an operation. We had four 18-foot skiffs and a 16-foot skiff. But, but those two boats that are sitting down here, they're Willie Roberts copies. Okay. They were, now, now, one of the things that, we talked to some guides. There's some guys who they're they're a one man operation. They love it. That's what they want. They don't want to complicate things. And then you talk to some guys who want to have multiple captains, but they're not sure about how to go about building that out. And you have all this experience from you know working with teams and training captains. What would you do to try to kind of figure out if somebody really had what it takes to work on the boat and be a captain for you? And then also, what would you do to try to train them to be able to take people out and have a good time and get on bonefish? What what I would do, I've got uh, my 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 greatest example is one one captain that works that, that's in the business now. He for the last eleven years he's run one hundred eighty eighty nine footer with a crew of sixteen, and he come to work for me from Maine, and he didn't know one end of a boat from the other, and I taught him in three years what you got to do. You got to, first of all, you got to take them, show them how to pole. And most of them, most all these young fellows can see. But the trick is what they're looking at. I had one fellow that worked for me for, he, him and I worked together for 35 years. I told you about the fellow that got a job on a sport fisherman. When we, when we got the 121 footer, they sold the fish boat. So Jack become a hunting fishing guide. Then they like to shoot quail and turkeys and things in South Florida, and they rent it. They lease land from the Likes Brothers over there on the other side of the lake. And um, Jack would work at the hunting part, but when we go on trips, he was a guide. He was always a guide, so always had it was Jack himself, and usually two more guys. I could all you you could train what Denny would do. You got to realize that Denny was he could guide himself. This is the boss's son. So he he could take a greenhorn. I mean, a kid just like his kid from Maine. He could take Keith, he took Keith Moore out and, and, and showed him. He says now, and he knew where to go because we've been, been doing it all these years. Yeah. So I would say, and we never had it's such a wide area and a vast area. You would see one another running around here, there, and everywhere, but you didn't have fish on top of one another. You got miles and miles and miles of places to fish. So then it would take, he'd be like the teacher. And he, he'd caught so many and done so much of it that he got a big kick out of taking these young kids fishing. And he'd help them learn how to read the water. And oh, yeah. You're saying they had good eyes, but they oh, just yeah. didn't really know what they were well, looking well, at. Well, the thing was, about you got to keep them tying up the boat. You know, run, you can't run into rocks. And you, and, and, but when you, most of these places we're fishing were mud. It's mud. West side of Andros, I mean, there's rocky spots. But most of it was, was mud and sand. So they, they would, they, and you, it didn't take them long to catch on, and they did get it. They did. These young fellows went on to sugar. I've got lots and lots of fellows that run boats now that work for me through the years. Yeah, is that what you found to be most important in in helping kind of raise up younger guides? Was just taking that time to go out on the water with them, and to you would rather take somebody that's a blank slate 
and kind of walk with them every step of the way than try to go find somebody. I, I, I wouldn't look for an experience. What What were you looking for when you were going after those guys? Uh, somebody wanted to learn. Somebody, somebody. I, I like young guys. Old guys always set in his set in his ways. Main thing is you need to fit. You need to fit in. In other words, you. Uh, I've I've had guys that I've taken to the Bahamas and and had them on a boat for two days and got got them on a plane and sent them home. You know they just didn't fit. I never took a resume in my life. A guy would come to me. He'd say, "Here's my resume." I said, "I don't need your resume." I said, "I'll try you." I'm getting ready to go to the Bahamas for 10 days, and I'll try you. If you work out, you stay. If you don't, we'll shake hands and part friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, cause that guy didn't get along on that job before don't mean that him and I can't get along. So I always, always hired that way. That makes sense. And then what were things that they did out on the water with the, their clients that you felt like set them apart? beyond just putting them on fish well the thing the thing you could do you you got to realize that it's it's always yes ma'am and yes sir you're never going to be these people's equal and you're never going to be their buddy buddy they're the boss and you're the employee he's not a friend he's your boss Mm -hmm. and uh, a lot a lot i've had uh, people be so envious of what these people had and just eat them up inside i just have to let them go wow yeah so they would just have somebody come in and they, they just couldn't handle someone having a better quote unquote setup than them with how they were doing things mm-hmm. or, and so respect was really important for you. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, it's easier for them to be real, real respectful to the boss and the boss lady and the, and the old man. And, but I would, I would go to the guest mm-hmm. and, um, I, li- I, I, I literally let two people go for what they said to, to the party. Yeah, yeah, you you, you got to you. Well, it gotta, sounds like you weren't afraid to let people go either. No, 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 no. I, that was that wasn't one of my. I know I'd let them go. But it's interesting because at the same time, I know that you had people work for you for a very long duration, and then at the same time, you weren't afraid to let people go. And I think that makes sense to me if I'm thinking about if I was working in a setup like what you were running, that if I'm really committed to this and respectful and I want to learn and I love getting out there and being on the team, and then here comes somebody that's just totally throwing the dynamic off. If you don't fire them, that person that's not working, you're going to probably lose people who are doing really well because they don't want to be around them. I heard, I heard a saying that there's something along the lines of Eagles don't want to be around chickens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that was the saying. Yeah. It sounds like you ran a a tight ship there. Mm -hmm. Did you end up liking the, so you said when you're, you're 34 years old, they came to you and said, we want you to run the buck pass. And, uh, did you end up liking the big picture kind of full captaining more than you thought you would? No, it would, it, it never was an ego thing with me. Never. Uh, fact of the matter is I, I've said it more than once. The best four years I ever had in yachting was the years I was made engineer because, uh, you didn't have responsibility. All I had to do was my job, and and the captain let me do my job. So I, uh, I mean, I was I was I was fat, dumb, and happy. Smoking and I a cigar made, I, and I only made that I only made that much. I didn't never I never made that much more money. Yeah, uh, being the captain and assuming all responsibility. The responsibility was it was never that. It never was a burden to me. I, I think too many people take it take it too serious of. Well, I, I'm the captain, you know, yeah. and whatever I say goes. And I, and I would say to him, I say, look, if, 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 if something ain't right around you, if I'm not acting right, if I don't act like I got good sense, if I'm saying something that's totally wrong and give me your opinion. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, this is a, this is democracy. This ain't a dictatorship. Mm-hmm. And, that, and a lot, a lot of captains and I, and I are very guilty of, of trying to be a dictator. And you had that red book where somebody come to you and say, hey, Captain, here's something that we need to work on. And you would actually do something with it. You would listen to them and then you'd turn that in. I think that speaks a lot about your ability to, to listen to other people. One of the other questions we love to ask people, especially people who've spent as much time in the industry as you have, is, you know, there's a lot of people that they want to be successful. And everybody has different views about what makes a successful captain or a successful life. To you, what, what does success mean? I, 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 if I look back on it, not patting myself on the back, um, 
being successful in my life is uh, uh, I think I've been a good father. I think I've been a good captain. But the Lord gave me that ability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very strong in my faith. Mm -hmm. I never, I never let the crew cuss. <laughs> I remember um, one time, uh, probably the most crude fellow I had on the boat that I worked for for 34 years. I remember him saying one time, he said, um, the deckhand we had hadn't been with us very long, and he was laying out some words, and he said, I'm going to tell you one thing, young man. He says, if you want to stay on this job, don't let the captain hear you cussing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was just one of the things, you know. It's, it's not a big thing, but... Uh, me, my, being successful, I named the three things that probably made me thinking I was most successful was I, I thought I was always fair with the owner. Mm -hmm. I, I was always trustworthy. If I come up short with money and I'm not a bookkeeper, I used to. I used to handle $25,000 on a trip. You can't use credit cards in, in South America for buying fuel and paying for helicopters and and, uh, and uh, customs and immigrations and all the things you have to spend money for. So I would take $25,000 cash out of the office, and I had a receipt book. And every cent that I, I kept, I, I lived by a pad and pen, and pen in my pocket, and I would write down everything and then I would write a receipt for that and when I came back I went right straight to the office and I'd sit down in the office with the, with the girl that did handle our account and we would count that money mm -hmm. cash here receipts here if I come up short I'd take it out of my pocket wow and but I later on Denny Denny told me he said Hastings he says I don't expect you, because a lot of times I carry a lot of these these fellows in the dugout canoe. You're giving them these little kids. They tell you not to give them more than two or three dollars. You know, you want to give them ten or twelve. Well, God, that's what some of them poor men made a month. So they would say, give them two dollars, two dollars, two dollars. So you end up giving up. So you'd always come up. You always came up short. I never never had too much. Always came up short. And as years went by, Danny found out through the office that I was doing that, that I was, I think one of the secretaries told him, says, you know, says Captain Hastings comes up with the money. If he's short, he, two or three hundred dollars, he'll, he'll, he'll come out of his pocket with it. Danny said, don't do that. So, but uh, being honest mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and know that ever uh, with, with boatyard bills, with, uh, there was so much money involved. Uh, we started the last year that we run the Buck Passer, uh, our, our, and, and nobody could believe that it was that small. But last year we run the Buck Passer, everything lock, stock, and barrel was one million dollars. Hmm. And we uh, and I had I had the owner of Bradford Marine. Uh, I, I showed him because we get every year we would come up with the ever October was the end of our fiscal year, and uh, I I showed. Uh, the owner, he said, well, he says, there's not a boat in this yard your size that doesn't take two or three million dollars a year to run. I said, well, it don't take two or three million dollars a year to run the buck passer. But the thing is, back when you were to shop, in other words, we, we, we shopped at Publix. Uh, we bought, we never were taken advantage of, and, and all the, uh, the, the, the same people give us fuel for 44 years. We bought fuel from them for it. We, we done uh, the electronics people work for us for 44 years. I mean, all those people that I dealt with were uh, not ripping us off. And, and, and it was easy to, to, to keep, the, keep the thing, the, the, the money's down. And it's obvious that you treated the boat and you treated all the finances as if it was your own. It'd be easy for people to say, look, not my money, not my problem. I'll buy groceries. But it's it's obvious that you had integrity and care and you really valued what you did. If you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing before it all started, 
What do you think you'd tell yourself at 13, 14 years old, hopping on a boat for the first time to work? Mm. You got me there. Um, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this much. I wouldn't change anything. It, it, it's been such a good ride. You know, it's, uh, it's been wonderful. <laughs> uh, been fun. It's uh, a lot of laughs, a lot of, a lot of good memories. Uh, but I can't think of anything if I, if I jumped back and I had to, had to start over where, where I'd have changed anything in any way, the good, bad, and the ugly. You know, it's the... Uh, yeah, there, there, I mean, there's there's a lot of bad. I mean, I, uh, I've I've run aground, bent wheels, uh, run aground, uh, couldn't get her off for two or three days. She fell down on her side, and it had stabilizer, <laughs> held her up, and <laughs> the old man had to sleep uh, on the floor. I mean, I can go on and well, on. Well, at and least on. <laughs> at least it, you know it was before cell phones, and you didn't end up on a account somewhere. No, we photos didn't. Did and end up, everyone's did, tagging did, you. Did, right, you're going round and round. No, yeah. we, uh, we 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 had her ups and downs. N- nothing, nothing, never drastic, but uh, uh, but did, did we, I I remember uh, uh, the, the time we run her aground and, and and couldn't get her off and in, in, uh, down in South Andros there, uh, it, there was nothing you could do about it. Then the wind got blowing real hard, and that's real shallow water, and, and, and she didn't come close to floating for two days. And there, every time she had big stabilizers, so every time that every time the tide would go out, she'd fall back down on that stabilizer, and there we'd be until the tide come back in and lift it up. Did y'all yeah. have the owners on the boat? Yeah, then Mr. Phipps had to sleep on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys do? Just had, make some drinks and smoke a cigar and no, watch well, the sunset? No, well, we, we, when, it, what, what, when it worked out that the tide was, she was falling over in the evening and at night, in the morning. So we, she would float during the day. We put skiffs over and go fishing. Hope the tide would come in. Well, there you go. Make the best. Yeah. Act like, or act like you meant to do it. You know. Yeah. So you don't no, have to anchor when but, you pull up like this, Mister Phipps. And, 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 <laughs> well, one time I run aground with the old boat uh, up in uh, the, the, when we had the fish boat in those days. And the boss's son, he thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Captain Hayes run boat aground. Captain Hayes run boat aground. Slapping his leg. I can see him now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's because they knew that you were a good captain. And, uh, you know, something that I, I as we kind of close out here, I, I just I don't want to miss a lot of guys that we talk to. They they deal with the trying to figure out how to really make marriage work. And it's tough when you're on the boat. And I think even when I think about the types of trips that you guys would do, I mean, there's some guys who, yeah, they got they wake up at five, but they're back home at six or six thirty. Um, what advice do you have for young captains well, uh, th- this I can tell you, and my wife will tell you. I dated my wife for four months and asked her to marry me. And I told her, I said, now let me tell you something. I work on a boat, and I'm going to be gone. And I'm going to be gone for long periods of time. I'm not getting married and start and become an electrician or a plumber or pumping gas or selling groceries. I work on a boat, and I'm going to be gone. And I want you to understand this. And if you want to marry me, that's what I'm going to do for a living. I've been married 57 years. No, no, excuse me. I got, got I added to that one. I've been married 55 years. My wife has never, ever said anything to me about me being gone. The only thing she will say is, you kind of feel bad when you see your husband packing his suit bag and he goes down and goes down the driveway smiling. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, don't let him see you smile. That's the takeaway. Let me ask you a, a kind of a follow-up question on that. What did it look like for you when you were home? It was my, my wife, um, one of a kind, uh, born and raised Florida gal, born and raised in Florida, raised three kids. They're about three years apart. They're, uh, LR, he's uh, 54 or 53, 50, and 47. And they all are very successful. They, uh, 
he's he's done his thing sport fishing all over the world that's he, that's he wanted to do my other son's a registered nurse uh works in the operating room him and his wife and uh my other daughter's a school teacher and 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 married and her husband and very successful in what she does and um we had a great family life um went on vacation every summer the kids would tell you we'd we'd load them up and i'd be gone over of course i had a month i had a, usually had a month off in the summer uh we had a great family life and my and the kids we we at the time uh, palm beach gardens florida was a, a small town at the time and uh, all kids were raised there we didn't have no trouble raising my, didn't have no trouble with the kids mm-hmm. and, and and had a, had a great marriage and and uh and great bringing the family up, and and everybody I've talked to, or three people say, well, kids went away, we didn't have nothing in common. I said, my God, kids went away, and me and wife really fell in love. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got any rapid fire questions you want to throw in? We- yeah, real rapid fire. Um, yeah, Josh can throw some rapid fire to you. Uh, just, yeah, go ahead. just just one, really. Hey, we're back with some rapid fire <laughs> questions <laughs> with Josh. <laughs> the informative section. Uh, just real quick, I mean, you talk about you were when you guys started started these big trips, going to the Bahamas and Mexico right. and and all this, and and you're running off a chart made in the 1800s. What advice can you give to? I mean, that's that's un, unheard of now. I mean, you can look at Google Earth and see what the bottom looks like. And uh, what advice can you give to some guys now that are maybe? I mean, they're not going to places that no one's ever been, but maybe they've never been you know, first coming into an area, what what kind of things can you tell them to help them out navigating through? Well, I, the first thing is you want good sunlight. And the next thing is you want it over your back. You don't want never go into the sun. And uh, uh, you, you, you need good daylight. And don't never anchor in any more than more water than you can dive up your anchor. In other words, don't anchor in 80 or 90 feet of water and, 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 and cross your fingers or you're ever going to get your anchor back. Uh, I, I, I hung anchor up twice, and uh, both times it was my dumbness. Um, I anchored up in 80 feet of water and wrapped that chain. And the, the, the chain weighed uh, chain weighed 1,400 pounds over 90 feet, and the anchor was 800-pound anchor, so you weren't going to lift it out with your hands. So I, I anchored up slick glassy calm down off South Andrews one night, got up next morning, got ready to pull the anchor, and oh, stopped right down. And I had, but I had had three boys on the boat. I had tanks, always had tanks on the boat. And it was just around a little head, about that big around, but I had to go down there and run rapid. Hmm. No, uh, if you, you use common sense, don't, don't, don't roll the dice. Don't, don't hope that it's going to be of spot to get through so um, you you wouldn't say you just have to pin it to win it <laughs> Some, sometimes i do that or, or you just trim it out for, trim risk it, it for the biscuit or just trim it out and roll across just your fingers. yeah <laughs> well i got another rapid fire question i'd love to throw in here you know when you spend 60 years working on the water you got lots of ups and downs and you mentioned that you you wouldn't go back and change anything but could you give any advice for somebody who's maybe in a down season um, what it looks like to persevere. Well, m- mo- most uh, most if if you if it's cardin whether you work in private boats and and my thing was I I I I, w- I wanted to get paid. In other words, I wanted a paycheck at the end of the week. I didn't want to worry about whether it's going to blow or whether the owner this guy's got a cold and he don't feel like going fishing today. So I I always was was uh, I'd rather. I'd rather make one hundred and fifty dollars a week, and then then make five hundred dollars one week and nothing the next. The, the thing I would I would I would do in a, in a heartbeat is start looking for another job. If you're discouraged, there's one out there somewhere. You may have to do a little skipping around. I I, I skipped around. I mean I've when I was younger. And another thing is, uh, a lot of people think grass is greener. And another thing is, people work for money. Uh, we never, never, never were the highest paid crew in this business, even though we were together as long as we were. But we all knew what we had. In other words, we knew that these were nice people we were working for. 
we had everything covered. We were hospitalization for the family, hospitalization for the crew, uh, subsistence, end of year bonus. But we didn't have the great big buck. In other words, we didn't. We probably, in my in my particular case, I would say I could have made twenty percent more than I made working on another job. But I knew what I had in extras, you know. In extras, in in in, in it means so much more because you ain't paying taxes on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, but um, you, you, I mean, a lot of people want to make the big buck. Mm-hmm. And the next thing is the grass is always greener. I mean, I'm, boy, I'm gonna go work for that. Just because you see that guy on the dock and he's all friends and buddy, and you have coffee and smoke down, sit down and smoke a cigar with him, don't mean he's a good guy to work for. Mm-hmm. Whole different ball game working mm-hmm. for somebody than uh, uh, than than just being friends with him. Another question I had: you'd mentioned that you were a man of faith and that your faith was important to you. What did it look like for your faith to kind of inform how you worked and lived as a captain? Well, I I, I always said you led by example. You 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 can't um, you people see how you act and how you tr- how you how you carry yourself and uh, how you interact with other people people and the people that the fuel truck driver. The, the Bahamian guide that you used. I had a Bahamian guide that didn't even bring him up. I had a Bahamian guide work for me for 12 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, every time we'd go to the Bahamas, he came aboard the boat. And sometimes he came back with us. And, and uh, people people judge you by how you act. Uh, uh, it, 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 you, you can carry on all this. Uh, uh, you... you you don't have to be religious and say it, and you have to be religious and show it. Mm-hmm. What was the most helpful thing for you in developing as a captain? The most helpful thing? The two years that I worked with Billy Holzman on the Nitso. By, by far, it could have, I could have, I could have stumbled along another ten or fifteen years working for different captains. That was that was going to college for me. Uh, like I said, there was there was nothing about boating from top to bottom that he didn't know, and he didn't only teach you; he let you do it. In other words, it was it was. It was I, I thanked him. I got to thank him. He was he was about fifteen twenty years older than I was, but he he was in his he was in his late thirties, and I was I was I was in my early twenties. But uh, going, go working for him, that that was that was the pinnacle of of my. And I can look back on that, and I I I learned more from him in two years than all the other captains I ever worked for in my life. But the dumbest captain in the world, you learn something from. Mm-hmm. You really will. There, there's something that he he'll show you, or you'll do, and you might not like the sucker, but uh, you 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 can pick up a, a good point from him. And that's a big reason we started this podcast was just to try to create a community where people can learn from each other and hear stories and get introductions to other captains. So thank you so much for taking some time this morning. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Larry. I, uh, oh, you're more than welcome. I, I ain't never done nothing like this before. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> hey, guys, once again, thanks for listening to The Captain's Collective. Please continue to help us out by sharing the podcast with friends and online. A quick post can go a long way. We hope that you guys are enjoying these interviews. Feel free to reach out to us online. Thanks for listening. This is the Captain's Collective.